Hi, this is Rishi Awatramani. I'm here with my co-host with the most, Adam Gold. Welcome to Organizing Upgrades. This is not a drill live where we draw out lessons for left organizers about electoral strategy. This is episode 10. Well, Adam, we're back again. It's been a couple months and it feels like we say it every episode, but things have just become crazier since the last time we talked. Every time we think things can't escalate, they will, and we should expect them to continue to escalate. It seems like uh, several million people, between three and four million, have voted already, which is hopefully good news. Um, but, you know, people are really focused in some ways still on Election Day, and there's still, you know, a question of the battle in the lead up to Election Day and a whole bunch of scenarios of what's waiting for us afterwards. It's true. It's true. And as always, we have to play major catch up since last time that we talked. Um, and everything feels urgent. But I think this moment is really key. Uh, you have Trump substantially behind in the polls um, nationally, but even in swing states uh, behind kind of historic numbers like Arizona poll that came out today, Biden is up by nine points. Whereas around this time uh, in 2016, Trump was up by one point in that state. Of course, you know, we, on the left, like we're trying not to rely too much on polls. We know what uh, that what happened with that in 2016 when the Democrats did rely on polls. Um, but you know, it does seem like between the continued destruction and mishandling of the coronavirus, um, the insane debate de de uh, debate performance uh, from Trump, and of course his subsequent hospitalization, along with apparently the infection of most of his friends and colleagues, that things are looking a little rough um, for the Republicans electorally. Um, and on our side, we're not resting. I think like we'll talk about tonight, um, people are hard at work, not, not uh, sitting back. There's new partnerships coming across uh, kind of all different types of movement forces nationally and locally. Um, independent political organizations in the states are uh, hard at work, you know, registering voters, uh, signing up people vote by mail, and even like you mentioned, Rishi, getting people to vote, which millions have already. Um, and there's still a lot of things that could go wrong. Don't get me wrong. Uh, this is a mess of an election. And so we um, need to keep being um, vigilant for the voter suppression, misinformation, disinformation. We want to hear how people are dealing with that um, on our show tonight. Um, so those are some of the questions we're going to dig into. Uh, we're going to have a great uh, group of guests. And uh, Rishi, why don't you let us know what's looking like? Yeah. So we, as Adam said, you know, we have a great set of guests. Uh, returning to the show is, uh, is Maurice Mitchell, Executive Director of the Working Families Party. Welcome back, Mo. We also have with us today Tenjiwa McHarris, longtime movement organizer and strategist, Cindy Wisner, a volunteer with the front line, amongst many other things, and Tanya Lee, National Secretary of Left Roots. And just to be clear, organizational names uh, that we've identified here are really just uh, for identity purposes only. Our guests are not necessarily representing the views of their organizations when they're speaking tonight. Um, before we dive in to that amazing panel, though, we just have a few seconds of housekeeping. We want to encourage everyone who's watching on Facebook and YouTube to throw your thoughts and comments into the chat as always. Um, please give Organizing Upgrade a like on Facebook. You know, our, our journal is really still just one of the few places where left and racial justice organizers can seriously debate strategy, not just sort of, you know, recite uh, or report journalistically their efforts or, you know, launch into left polemics. One of the ways that we're able to sustain this work um, is uh, the, you know which requires just a huge volunteer effort is with uh, your donations and support. Um, please do help sustain organizing upgrade with the donation. Someone should be posting uh, the link to do that in the chat. Um, we, as always, also want to say thanks to our partner, the Real News Network, for holding down all the tech and video production. There is a long list of co-hosts um, who are signed on to support this event tonight. I'm not going to list them all. Um, they all deserve a big thanks uh, and a big hello to the audiences of all of those groups that have tuned in tonight. Um, somebody will also be sharing the Twitter handles of all, our, all of our guests in the comment threads. Please follow and engage all of them on their social media channels too. All right, Adam, let's get into it. Great. So Tenji, I want to start with you. Um, Last month, uh, the launch of the Frontline, 
a new project um, by the Movement for Black Lives Electoral Justice Project, a Working Families Party, and a bunch of other important supporters. Was, um, it was inspiring for a lot of reasons, um, not the least of which because uh, it really centered uh, Black left leadership um, in the anti-Trump front that's been built, right? Um, and given the timing of the launch just a couple months before the election, um, it would be great, uh, you know, to hear what you think, what this project is about, you know, what kind of tactical, strategic interventions the front line's trying to make, and, and why. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. I, I also, one, it's just a real honor to be here with these comrades. I have a lot of love and respect and um, just deep appreciation for these three. Um, so to be able to just share space, let alone talk about this really critical, important moment means, <laughs> means a great deal to me. I, I also just want to say there's two other leaders here, Cindy and Maurice, who have played really pivotal, significant roles in the front line. And so mm -hmm. while I'll share some thoughts, I really want to hear from them um, around, um, you know, the front line and, and what it means and, and why it's such a necessary intervention. But, but I will say, because I work with the movement, movement for Black Lives, but also the, the, the brilliant, powerful work of the Movement for Black Lives um, Electoral Justice Project, you know, this was an opportunity, a moment to really show the power of Black leadership, the significance of Black leadership, but also the real need to build movement infrastructure in this time to mobilize hundreds of thousands of people to protect the ballot, to engage in election pr protection, democracy, defense, um, uh, hundreds of thousands of people um, in this moment to, to respond and really protect people's um, right to engage in this process in a way that honors sort of the, the need for this country to actually really one day recognize radical democracy, but also to try to prevent the, the, this particular president from trying to capture the election. And so it was a way in which to, to respond in the very immediate in this moment, but also while looking ahead, while forecasting what's going to, what's going to, be required of many of us in the weeks, months, and years ahead. You know, oftentimes people talk about this moment in three different phases. Right now, we're in, in the phase of between now and and and, and the in the election, and obviously people are, are are voting. We're asking people to to vote now. You don't wait till November third to vote. As, as as people continue to talk about and lift up, you vote now, and it, the, the voting really um, concludes uh, at the end of November third. And then the second phase being that seventy nine day period with some scholars and, and folks are calling sort of uh, the interregnum or this period where there is a number of things that are going to happen. There's going to be a number of ways this current administration is going to try to capture the presidency, is going to try to legitimize um, folks' votes uh, to try to also stoke confusion and chaos and really harm uh, a number of folks uh, across the country in terms of being able to connect with, with their right to vote, their right to sort of radical democracy. And so that it's also a moment where we need movement infrastructure more than ever. And of course, and, and I'll wait to go into it, we have whatever happens um, uh, on Inauguration Day, and hopefully there won't be two people that show up uh, for, for president, uh, but there is, there will be either a Biden presidency um, or a Trump presidency. And then what we really need and movements are required to have, if they consider themselves movements, is to also be ready and have a plan on what we do, no matter what the sort of scenario and outcome what is. So it's really an opportunity for us to be aligned, to plan, to prepare. And it's also honoring Black leadership in the midst of a moment of powerful, beautiful Black uprising. You know, people keep talking about this, is, this, this moment, what we saw recently, as being the sort of largest movement in U.S. history. And I think what the front line has done, and, and, and a lot of shout out to people like Mo and Cindy, it's saying um, movement is, is about uprisings, but it's also about um, having a kind of infrastructure that really captures, mobilizes, organizes people into action over the long term and really creates political homes. So it's how do we make meaning of moments of crisis, but how do we turn uprisings in, into moments of powerful mass movements? Yeah, that's really helpful, Tenji. And I think, uh, Mo, I want to bring you in here because I think, you know, Tenji points us in the direction of some really important questions. Given, you know, how uncertain, uh, you know, how uh, things are going to play out, not only over the next several weeks, but on election day and after the election, if we think about those phases, 
Can you tell us, you know, how uh, is the Working Families Party? How is the frontline thinking, you know, about the sort of concrete scenarios that lie ahead of us, right? Like, what is your view of this, of those scenarios uh, based in the work that you guys have been doing already? Um, how are you all orienting the work that you're doing now towards, you know, the different paths that things can take? Sure. And uh, before I begin, I, I would be remiss if I didn't just honor my comrades. And I'm, I'm so grateful to be in league on, on this screen, but also in a number of fronts with them. And it's just an honor to, to be in conversation with them. And also Rishi and Adam, always great to be with you. Um, so to, um, to answer your question about the various scenarios, I, I've, in a number of occasions, I've called 2020 the great humbling, right? So um, if anybody had suggested that in January or February, like, like the Iowa caucuses took place in, in 2020. <laughs> it's kind of hard to believe, but that's true, right? And so if anybody had argued um, after the Iowa caucuses or after the New Hampshire caucuses or after uh, Nevada, where we would be today with Joe Biden at the top of the ticket, a global pandemic, um, a president that is possibly very, very sick, a reckoning on black lives, um, you know, these intersecting crises. I mean, people would probably have thought that that person or that strategist was um, ungrounded or just, you know, had to take off their tin foil cap. But that that is absolutely where we are. So why I say that is that we absolutely should do all types of scenario planning. In fact, many of us have been planning for this scenario before all of these conditions, right? Um, however, we need to lean into a, a great amount of humility in how we approach these scenarios because there's a whole range of scenarios that we can't predetermine based on, you know, everything that we, all the information that lays before us. So I'm encouraged by the, by the polling. And also I try not to get on and off the polar coaster. Right. And we saw in the past, like polling is based on modeling and it's the polling is only as good as the methodology. And we could be off. We've seen that in 2016, even though folks have improved the methodology um, in, in, in current polls. So the, the best, best case scenario, the best, best case scenario is that Donald Trump is a one term president and uh, the Republicans lose power um, in the Senate. That is the best, best case scenario from an, uh, an electoral standpoint. Even in that best, best case scenario electorally, we, we should still anticipate that there's likely to be vigilante political violence. Why? Because there currently is, right? There, there currently is political violence. People have sustained uh, uh, casualties over th these past few months. And there's no, there's nothing indicating that that is some, somehow going to die down. So we should bake that into any of the planning that we have. And we should uh, be able to uh, come up with strategies in order to make sure that our, our folks are safe, that our folks feel empowered. We understand that the cynicism, despair, and fear that the far right is attempting to, to conjure only benefits them, right? And it's our job in order, and it's our job to really challenge that and to inspire folks to believe that collectively we could, we could shift the outcomes the way we want to. But in that best, best case scenario, we still have our work cut out for us because we're currently in this united front against Trump that includes a number of forces. And those forces don't agree with each other on fundamental things. They agree with each other tactically that we need to defeat Trump. And if we're successful, and that united front is successful tactically, then there's no more utility for that united front and the various factions are gonna go their separate ways, including contending with one another. And I think we should anticipate that as those of us who are on the left, anticipate the moment the best best case scenario takes place, we have our work cut out for us because the first battle is gonna be a narrative battle, right? Who actually is able to tell the story about the victors? Who actually were the, the protagonist that won the election, right? And not only the victors, but what do those victors want, right? It's gonna be incumbent on us that we interrupt the, the neoliberal version, which is, um, it's, a, it's a quote unquote time for healing after the, the four years of trauma, we need to all come together. Um, we need to thank the suburban women, which is code for um, ideologically sort of um, undeveloped 
white people in suburbs, these imagined suburbs, as we know, suburbs are very diverse, um, but we need to thank them. They, they, they are the victors and therefore we need to govern in the most traditional third way, neoliberal way possible. The other narrative might be, um, and this might be a narrative offered by the never Trumpers and the, the, neo, the, the neoconservatives that are now in this electoral united front and we could either take them seriously or be cynical about their interest in this electoral united front. Directly after, if there's a victory, they, they'll argue that it was, you know, it was people like the Lincoln Project and, um, you know, Trump, never Trump Republicans who, who made the margin of, dip, uh, of victory and therefore the Biden, uh, Biden uh, Harris campaign, um, uh, Biden Harris White House should govern like, uh, like Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan, right? And, you know, I think the thing that we need to fear is given uh, how volatile our economy is, the conditions where both Republicans and Democrats might agree and align on austerity policies and austerity politics. And everything, our, all of our agenda, uh, from uh, the Green New Deal to the Breathe Act, you name it, all of those agendas, uh, agenda points are, are very much uh, in, about investment, about investing deeply, about uh, invest, investing in our people, investing significantly in, in the commons. And, if, if they win that, that fight around whether or not we're in a moment of austerity, then we're going to lose the ability to govern the way we want to. So, so I'm just talking about the best case scenario, right? And I, the reason why I say that is that we can't just focus on the proximal intervention of, de of defeating Trump. We have to focus on the proximal intervention, but connect that to the, the long arc change. So when we defeat Trump and when this united uh, front dissolves, and when these forces attempt to uh, win the narrative war and tell the story that they want in order to set the parameters of what's possible, what is the less role in that? How do we win that war? How do we ensure that our movements are the main protagonists and that we could uh, position ourselves in 2021 to have uh, a very bold, transformative structural change agenda on, on the federal, state, and local level. Now, the worst case scenarios are ones where Donald Trump doesn't concede, um, he, he, he tries to hold on to power. I wanna caution people, I think we need to take this very seriously. We need to take right-wing um, militias and um, uh, their violence very seriously, but we can't be deterred and we can't develop um, uh, a, a sort of, um, we can't allow the fear of their violence and their tactics to, to uh, impact our organizing because ultimately part of their ter ta fear tactics is to suppress our organizing and to suppress our vote, right? And so we have to really look at it for what it is. Their, their grabby sort of um, cling to power is a demonstration of their desperation, right? Whenever, whenever the state is uh, that naked with its, with its uh, aggression, it's, it's because they're, they're desperate. And when they surface those contradictions, everybody sees those things. So that, that ultimately, I think the, those activities of the far right and Donald Trump, and it's not just Donald Trump, it's the whole apparatus of the Republican party. That's another thing, Donald Trump is not an aberration. He needs to be in league with, you know, the Republic, the st on the state level, the Republican parties, as well as the whole federal um, bureaucracy in order to pull some of this stuff off. Um, I'm still encouraged in that worst case scenario that um, yes, he has his hardcore supporters, but like we saw, you know, a few months ago with um, with the uprising, that there's still a core of people in this country when they when they witness governmental overreach, they respond and align with our side, and so uh, I think we need to be really nimble in that moment and appeal to the to broadly to not just in the left, we need to appeal to all people to align with democracy and align with our vision. So in, in any case, you know, I'll, I'll just end by saying, you know, we're going to have to be nimble and we're going to have to build durable power. And one of the things that the front line is doing, and I, uh, I just want to do a, a, a shameless plug. Anybody that's watching should text the word frontline to 30403 to become a frontline volunteer. We're, we're, we're scaling thousands of people and doing political education, we're training folks, we're training folks on tactical roles, so that in any of those scenarios, 
um, we'll have a, a network of people all across the country that will be prepared to engage on the narrative fight, prepared to engage on the ground, uh, ensure that people aren't just, we don't just de-escalate, but that our folks, especially in poor and working class communities and especially poor and working class communities of color, um, feel empowered when they vote, feel a sense of pride when they vote, feel uh, closer and closer to, to living in self-determined communities when, they're vote, when they vote. And that's our job. Our job is to resist the cynicism and despair and, and organize in this moment like never before. Yeah. There's a lot to dig into there, but actually I think on that very last, and we'll come back to a lot of stuff about kind of the, the program and the, and the platform and stuff that y'all are putting out. But on that last point, you know, about, um, fighting cynicism, I want to ask you, Cindy, and kind of bring you in here. You've, you've put a lot of effort into the front line as a volunteer, as, as, um, as we mentioned in the intro, but, you know, you've also been part of a lot of organizations, networks that have, that have themselves had a lot of cynicism about engaging in elections in the United States, right, because of the history, because of the kind of conditional citizenship that so many have in this country and, and, um, and you know, the kind of lesser of two evils situation that we often find ourselves in, but, but clearly something has changed, at least in terms of this project. Could you just talk about um, how you and your work kind of came to the urgency of the front line? And, and is, that, is that just because of this election? Is it kind of an overall broader shift, do you think, in, in orientation? Or, or, yeah, where are you at with that? First of all, I want to say what's up, saludos to my compañeras, compañerics, um, all of you. Um, I've been in political movement with many of you for some up to like 25 years, um, more than that. Um, so aging us here a bit. So just a lot of, uh, a lot of love um, to you and to everyone watching um, that's joining this, this conversation and this dialogue at this moment. You know, we're 28 days. Um, from November 3rd. Um, we're very clear that it's going to be a contested election. Um, we're very clear that um, we need to, we're, we're, in a, we're in a fight of our lives. And, you know, you can look back to like, you know, 20 years ago, and somebody probably said, this is the most important election of our lifetimes. And they were probably right at that moment for many reasons. But I think for our generation and for us, at this moment in time and sort of in, in, in the in world history. Um, I think that we need to be able to be ready to um, defeat um, authoritarianism, defeat the, the road to neo-fascism, but also be very clear about uh, the dangers of neoliberalism, right? Both the, the Trump's neoliberalism, um, but also Biden's uh, form of neoliberalism. And so I think that whatever it is, we need to be able to be on the uh, offensive. Come um, this next phase after the election, we got we can't be we can't be caught um, like we were four years ago or before that when the Obama moment, right? Uh, progressives, the left, independents, um, revolutionaries. Um, it is our task to be involved in this struggle around a, a moment in, in history where we actually have to, the stakes are so high, both for our communities um, that we care about, for the issues that we work so hard on, on our day-to-day -day basis, um, the things that we defend um, and the things that we protect, and also because, and also the planet. And there's no more um, sort of, again, sort of uh, moment in history we're also our international allies, um, social movements from the global south um, that are also asking us to uh, take this mandate seriously and take uh, uh, one of these uh, authoritarian patriarchal assholes out <laughs> of office and to be able to actually create more political space, um, not only for us in the United States, um, to, to figure out how to navigate the terrain, but also know that the right wing bash clash is going to come whether or not Trump continues in office or not. And we just need to be able to be better positioned um, in this moment to be able to, to engage in that fight. And I think that, you know, it's true what you said, um, Adam, is that in a lot of ways, 
the left um, has had a, um, uh, at least in my experience, um, you know, there's been a le level of left absenteeism um, in relationship to the elections. But more than anything, I think it's an underdeveloped, underdeveloped muscle. And I think that it's always, our, our folks have always engaged in electoral work on the local level, right? Um, where we've like helped run city council folks, we've run uh, at school district um, level, we've been able to uh, move legislative battles on a city or municipal or statewide level. And there have been many organizations, particularly in the last decade or more, that have been building up these uh, state-based power caucus, the new majorities, um, a whole bunch of different movement infrastructure that's beginning to be scaffolded that is very clear uh, and has a criticism of the bourgeois democratic sort of apparatus, but that knows that we can't um, leave that site of struggle um, uncontested, right? And, and, and that's one of those places that we got to like take off the gloves and get in there and fight. And so I think that's one thing that's important. The second thing is that, you know, when we think about like sort of more movement left strategy is like we think about different levels of power. And sometimes our movement is uncomfortable with actually power. And, and, and we have to have more conversations about what it means, right? Because we're just talking right now at the level of representative uh, uh, democracy, and that's one, one stage of the battle. But then the, much of our work has been about participatory democracy, right? Where we, our people, our communities have a right to say, have prior and informed consent, have ability to, to direct budgets, to say where resources need to go. And that's where some of our policy work, like the BREATHE Act, a lot of our work from the divestment and investment struggles that we've been part of in the EJ community have been part of that. But I think that at the end of the day, many of our folks also want direct democracy. And I think that that's also really important. And so we got to figure out how we think about these are all practice levels. And at a certain moment, this moment calls on us to build uh, the most uh, broadest front against um, neo-fascism and neoliberalism. And in this context, we're, we're, we're going to experiment with operational unity and see if, if in, through this process we can actually move some level of strategic alignment so that we can actually be a stronger, more vibrant left that can actually be, begin to move um, on the issues that really matter to us. And so I think that's why I'm super excited about volunteering with the front lines because one, we all need to volunteer so you just don't get paid to, to do movement work. We got to volunteer and go back to that notion that the way most movement folks around the world do is that they volunteer on issues they care about. And most of the members in our organizations do that. And then number two, and so I'm asking you to join the front line um, and, uh, and pledge and be part of the process. But number two is really to think about that this campaign has three components, right? That one, it's really about creating a visionary agenda that's based on the people's charter, on policy demands. It's an invitation to cohere our progressive and left forces into a collective campaign. And it's also to engage in joint practice. And part of that, it's like, that's what is gonna be important for us to not only defeat Trumpism and weaken white supremacy um, and deal, deal a blow to that right-wing um, authoritarianism, but also to push Biden and Harris and the neoliberal camp to the left, right? And I think that that's important. Our movement demands need to be front and center in terms of then being able to have some of those policy changes and not and that ha bigger sort of counter hegemonic level of the of the war ideas where we've seen that happen. It it, it happened with the massive uprising with movement for black lives, but you've seen it around Standing Rock, you've seen it around the Me Too movement, you've seen it around the New uh, Namas, right, the women's movement uh, that, that has created moments in which we can actually begin to see our demands be made to what's normal and, and, and uh, right. And I think that's our opportunity here. And so this campaign is beyond the election, but it's also an invitation for us to build with each other in ways that we're not used to and with folks that we don't always usually like, but that we have to be clear on mission. 
So that's our challenge, but I also think it's our opportunity to be able to lead and have this effort be led by radical, transformative Black folks in a multiracial front. Man, just feeling reminded how uh, it's been about a couple decades that Cindy's been motivating me. That's my organizer in chief right there. Um, we've we've put a lot on the table um, over these last three comments, and I think one of the one of the most important uh, points of the many that Cindy just made, right, is that sort of regardless of whether, you know, we've there's sort of been a sort of left abstentionism in terms of uh, electoral politics or people just for a long time doing different types of electoral strategies and tactics, we've, we haven't always actually had like a clear left strategy how elections fits into sort of a broader plan for systemic change. Um, and, you know, I really want to bring in Tanya in on this point um, because, you know, uh, of conversations that me and my comrade and Tanya have had and other places I've heard her talk, you know, um, you've been thinking a lot about how this election relates to sort of longer term strategy. You know, of course, the sort of the uncertain outcome of this election can make it hard to actually develop and ground sort of both medium and long term strategy. But can you tell us about how you're thinking about just, you know, not just sort of the rest of the year, but medium and long term strategy in your view, you know, do the various scenarios of this election cycle affect where we go from here? Or how do you sort of view the, the longer term? Thanks for that question. Um, hey, comrades. Um, hey, everyone. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I, I have so much to say. Um, this is such an incredibly important political moment, as Cindy said, in world history, in fact. Um, and I, I think the question of strategy for anyone who is serious about actually winning liberation is a primary question. And I think before I, I say go to get into some of the specific ideas around the role of strategy in this moment, I just want to go back to what uh, Mo was saying about cynicism and despair um, in the moment right now and um, the heaviness um, that so many people are feeling. Um, and that I just feel like this assault, this sort of ideological assault on our people with the idea that not only we should be afraid, but really the fact that we can never win is the thing that we have to be steadfast in refusing. And we need to be the people who say both that a strategy is about taking us one step closer to winning. And they really don't want us to believe that we can win, like really win, like win the world we want, win liberation, win a socialist future. But the only way we're going to win is with a strategy. We're not going to stumble upon victory, <laughs> right? Um, we're not going to like get lost in the wilderness and find our way there. Um, it's only going to be through a strategic set of advances. And I think for those of us who have been really trying to figure out how do we defeat this beast of racial capitalism, and actually make that advance are trying to think about what is the role of defeating the current Trump authoritarian bloc, right? This, this essential central objective right now of defeating this bloc, to preventing their further consolidation over the capitalist state rule right now. Um, what's the role of that defeat in an advance? And, um, one of the things, so we, we have this idea that if you have a, a, a strategic orientation to actually winning liberation, right? A set of strategic advances, right? And you have a path to power that you've thought through in Left Roots, we've developed some tools to help us think about that. Um, then you can say, we not only have to defeat Trump just on the, just for the immediate, but for the sake of the next stage of struggle, which is to defeat the neoliberals, which is for the sake of the next struggle, which is a further advance of the left, et cetera. And there's several steps down the road to actual victory. And when you think about it that way, it, it makes the stakes higher 
for our work that we're doing on the ground. I'm calling black voters all the time here in Philly, for example. Um, it's because the stakes are not just about November, what happens in November or even what happens in January. The stakes are about, are we able to actually make an advance that's gonna set us up as a left to advance our struggle in the next period. And thinking like that, thinking for the sake of what, for this next stage and then that for the next stage is how I'm hoping more of us can get trained to think so that we um, aren't, we don't have like a thousand bold and exciting plans across the country, but we actually have some shared strategy that can actually give us a fighting chance to win <laughs> one day. Um, and part of what's so exciting to me about the front line right now is the fact that there's this building, this cohering that's happening, this really building on all the movement infrastructure and, and badass organizing that has happened over the last five, 10 years, this incredible cohering of left leadership, alignment of so many of our forces, um, that kind of coherence is the direction our folks need, need. And for me, the thing that's exciting is not only is that, cohe that cohering gonna make it more possible that we de defeat this MF uh, right now, but that it's gonna strengthen our ability to organize against Biden should he win, defeat the whole neoliberal bloc that's, that's ruling capitalism it's for the sake of the next stage and give us a fighting chance to actually have a more strategic left that we need. Thanks, Tanya. And I guess we should say it's great to have all of you with us because you are also uh, nice and uh, with each other and we all do have such deep and, and long relationships. It's, it's exciting to be able to get into this. Um, Maurice, uh, kind of building off uh, of what Antonia was saying and, and going back to uh, connecting it back to what you were saying about kind of the story of who wins, right, this election. Um, I also uh, get kind of somewhat uh, obsessed with how that plays, you know, how, who gets to set that narrative, how that happens, how the story is told. And, and you know, let's be clear, we're not assuming um, victory in this election at all, but uh, whatever happens, there's a story that's told and there's kind of everybody wants to make it their voters uh, that that made the difference. So I'm just wondering how you, whether it's at Working Families Party, the front line are, are thinking about how to influence that. Obviously, we do not on the left control the media apparatus, um, but how does the program, the kind of... Um, the platform that the front line has developed or, or the work you have in rolling it out, how, what kind of efforts are you taking to then uh, inform, inform the story after the election and kind of build, build an actual program for the left and for what it is that people want and deserve? Sure. Well, you know, number one, nature doesn't like vacuums. And I think that that's true for power and political power, right? And traditionally, and there's a number of reasons for this, Traditionally, a lot of the infrastructure and capacity that is at, that is dedicated to electoral organizing on the left, and I, I want to be humble and say that that capacity has been uh, under-resourced for generations. But that capacity, part of that under-resourcing resourcing is the boom and bust nature of the electoral organizing sort of cycle. So we, we build all of this infrastructure for the proximal electoral intervention. And then like a Hollywood set or like a Broadway play, you strike, you strike all of that infrastructure directly after the election. And so what happens is you don't carry any of that power you built into the next fights. It, it just kind of dissipates. And it, it actually, so this is one of the reasons why I often say that, yeah, you could absolutely win um, proximal electoral or issue victories and have the outcome be, have, you have less power, right? You could win towards less power. And I, I even, I feel like it, 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 it's sort of the logic of neoliberalism where, you, you know, it, you want to count your victories, like you want to have metrics. And so there's this focus on winning things and counting your wins versus building power. And, and there's a significant difference. And the reason why 
I say that in, in relation to this question that, that you posed. We may win the election, we may lose the election, but if we engage in a strategy that is focused on building durable power, then post-election, we'll be prepared to be nimble and respond based on all everything that we've aggregated through this fight. So one of the um, intentions around the front line is that it is year long. We're not simply trying to uh, make this quick intervention for the election. We understand that every single phase requires us to continue to build power and to continue to form an intervention. So we talked about post, post outcome. We don't know if it'll be uh, uh, a victory or a loss, but post outcome, that united front is gonna dissipate on some levels. If we lose, it's still critical for the narrative to claim who, who was the cause of the loss. And you know, I say that victories have a thousand parents and that, that losses are, are often orphaned and, it's, and, and historically have been put on the doorstep of the black community. Right. So if you if you remember post 2016, um, Trump won by very, very small margins. Trump won by 44,000 votes in Pennsylvania. If you remember some of the some of the analysis from that was, you know, black folks just didn't turn out in Obama level, uh, Obama level sort of uh, 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 intensity in their in, in black folks turnout. If they did, we would have won the election, putting the loss at the at the orphaning the loss and putting it at the doorstep of black folks. I guarantee you, if there's a victory, you won't hear those same voices claim black folks won the election. They'll claim our forces do. And so th the reason why I say that is that it's incumbent on us that in this period where you have to remember before inauguration day, let's just talk about a win scenario. That is the transition period. That's where serious decisions around uh, both the parameters of, of debate and the parameters of the of the issue agenda, as well as the personnel who will execute it, gets determined. So what generally happens, like I said, is, you know, all of this intensity up until election day, and then our forces, our forces are, are atrophied, our forces don't have the capacity to continue on. There is a lull between election day all the way to the January 20th, and then people re-engage. If you're re-engaging um, by, um, by January uh, 20th, by inauguration, you're re-engaging in a field that's already been set by other forces. You've missed that window. You know, that, that vacuum was filled by forces other than your own. And so you can make interventions, but the interventions will be limited by the parameters set by other forces. So we're gonna need to actually figure out how to build momentum, whatever the outcomes, post. And the other thing we need to step away from is thinking about the tactical intervention. So when we're onboarding individuals to the front line and we're onboarding individuals in the thousands and it's exciting to see that scaling, we're not onboarding them to focus on a tactic. We're onboarding them to focus on a strategy and so that they understand all of these tactics are, are simply ways to achieve this long-term strategy. So we want folks post-election to um, you know, put down the tactic of peer-to-peer -peer texting for GOTV and pick up the tactic of uh, mobilization and protest. And then put down the tactic of mobilization and protest and engage in grassroots lobbying. And you know, be able to seamlessly um, use all the capacities, just vote, yes, protest, yes, study, yes, organize, and, um, and have those tactics arrayed in one, one common strategy. Our ability, our ability to begin to build that muscle is gonna be key to, um, you know, to the, the victory that Tanya was talking about, right? But when we do these sort of uh, boom and bust, tactical booms and bust, you know, we bring people on, we extract from people and people get burnt out and then we build another thing. And as long as we do that tactically, folks who have strategic capacity are always gonna be ahead of us. And I would say that the far right um, has a significant amount of strategic capacity. Um, and, you know, I don't know if folks remember this, but he was really clear. Uh, Rahm Emanuel said, if Joe Biden wins, there's two things he should be, he should do. First on his agenda, ensure that the Green New Deal doesn't happen. Second on his agenda, ensure that Medicare for all doesn't happen. Now, why would he say that? It's because he's a committed, committed neoliberal. Uh -huh. And 
and they understand the threat. There's a very real threat um, of us piercing through. All of this activity um, that took place during the primary has led to where all of our issues are majoritarian. They're majoritarian issues. So <laughs> it, it's, in, it's incumbent that we fail for the neoliberal pro project. And so actually in some ways, they're more threatened by us than the far right in a win, in a win scenario because our, we've done the organizing work, although the left candidates in the primary weren't victorious, the left issues were. And mm -hmm. so um, I think it's gonna be um, really incumbent on us. When I heard that from Rahm Emanuel, I felt like we are doing something right. We need to gather our forces and push through on our issue agenda um, and, and figure out how to um, concretize these gains while Medicare for all um, and uh, free college and a number of our issues are popular. How do we lock in those gains? That's gonna be the question of 2021. And one of the reasons why we need to keep the momentum going post-election. Yeah, that's right. Um, that actually segues perfectly into a question I want to ask Tenji, because you know I think like like Mo's suggesting, right? We uh, there's a number of issues that left that the left and left progressives have kind of won the narrative battle on. Not everything, and you know sometimes people make more of it than it is. But on a number of things, some of which Mo suggested, you know we've sort of proven uh, that we've sort of won the narrative initiative. Um, but, you know, and I think sort of coming off out of the uprisings this summer, right, it, it was broadly through polling demonstrated that there's like broad, there's broad popular support for, for broad racial justice goals and the broader movement for black lives, even a sort of specific support for particular demands wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Can you, you know, given sort of Mo's impetus to like, you know, have us be in a moment of humility, um, but still sort of, you know, trying to find audacious strategy, can you tell us how, you know, you think about this sort of incredible turn in political opinion in the opportunity that it presents, given that, you know, our sort of movements have asserted themselves ideologically, have found a lot of support, but still maybe lack the organizational vehicles to marshal forces on the ground, the sort of majoritarian opinion uh, on the ground? You know, what, is it, what does it mean for us um, in terms of the, the broader set of social forces that we're trying to relate to, including, including the Democratic Party? Sorry, I was on mute. It's hard after hearing everyone talk. I kind of just want to jump in. So, but I think this is such an important question. And what you're lifting up is so critical because oftentimes, and I really think it's because of the ways in which neoliberal tendencies have impacted organizing culture. Um, we mm -hmm. tend to think that growing popularity um, um, around demands and values in the absence of a power building strategy um, uh, is sufficient. And the, the beautiful and powerful thing about this moment is that what we're, I think what we're, what we're seeing is, is that, um, two things are really, are really key. It is important that, uh, that our idea, these ideas, these values are speaking to not just the needs of our people, but the imaginations of our folks. And they, they are not just about this current moment. This is part of a legacy of resistance and part of a legacy of organizing and, and really a legacy of demands from people, from communities for generations. And what we see popularized is, um, it, it's almost like, a, it, it, it's sort of like, it, it's, it's beyond an awakening. It's sort of the, the, the fact that everybody should have health care, the fact that you shouldn't have to pay for college, the fact that you shouldn't have to pay for rent, the fact that the, it, it doesn't make any sense that this government spends $115 billion on policing and, pe and, and teachers don't have enough money in, in order to be able to educate students in the classroom. Like these things are things that we've been, that our, our, our people have been fighting for for generations, our ancestors, our elders, and they've been, they've been living in sitting in the bellies of our people forever. My grandmother sat in the belly of my grandmother, my mama, and me. And so in this moment, yes, we have sort of the popularization of these demands, but what we also have sort of is a clarity that our people have been demanding it. And the, tr and, and the reality is, is, is that it, it, it speaks to sort of what, what, what our people deserve. I think what is significant about this moment though, and, and, and which is why I really appreciate what, what and Tanya and Mo said about we can't rely on doom and gloom strategies, end of the world strategies, 
strategies, we really have to look at the hope in this moment. The hope of this moment is not necessarily just the popularization of these demands, the sort of lifting up in the mainstreaming of, of, of these like, co- like these rights for our people. The, the, the power and the hope in this moment is our so millions and millions of people realize that it can happen. And I think that's mm-hmm. sort of the, the mandate for us as movement leaders and, and organizers in this moment. Millions and millions of people are not just calling for it in the streets. They know uh, with certainty that it's possible. And so who are we as movement leaders to adopt sort of um, a feeling or a sense uh, of that, that these things that that, that we have doubt essentially in our le- in, in, in what's possible. Our people, millions of people around the world believe and know it's possible. And we have to have that sort of knowing that it is possible in our bones, in every sort of fiber of our being. We have to know that we are going to create a radical realignment of power. We are going to create a, 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 a world in which the ways in which the political structure and the economic structure doesn't exist the way it does. And people do have what they need, not just to survive, but to also thrive. That's but right. we can do that. But we will not do that without a power building strategy. We, we, it will be virtually impossible. And then if we do not have a power building strategy to accompany it, accompany it guess what happens to those demands and values? It gets co-opted and it gets, right. it gets, um, t- it gets sort of cast captured by centrists who will essentially make perversions off of our politics, who will make perversions off of our values um, and really capture our capture the the, the sort of the, the energy of the moment. And so what this moment really calls for is we get to really um, declare that millions and millions of people, more of us than them, know and deserve, know and understand the sort of um, uh, the society that they deserve. And now what we have to do is not only just build a power building multi-decade strategy, but we also need to build the type of infrastructure that can help be the vehicle to execute that strategy. And Tanya, you have, want to just see if you have stuff to add to that and kind of from your um, you know, I, I don't know. I just saw you nodding a lot. <laughs> if you want to add to that, I'm or so I can excited. ask you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just so the. I, I just it really resonates with me the um, concern that Tenji's raising around um, our peop- our confusion um, around you know popularity versus actually building power and power building. And um, I think <clears throat> it definitely is p- product of you know the impact of organizing. We're a couple generations in, really, to organizing under neoliberalism. And I think uh, part of what is so interesting to me in this moment is that they're actually, and, and exciting, is that there's actually a layer of leadership of folks, you know, those of us here, but many, many, many others who came up in grassroots organizing who know how to do the hard daily work of base building, developing grassroots leaders, building working class organizations that build power, and who have enough skin in the game to have realized that that local power building work wasn't sufficient, helped to build national alliances, national level infrastructure. So we have things like right to the city, we have rising majority, we have movement for black lives as a national network who have built these new national infrastructures over the last period, who have built state power building electoral arms. The, this is part of the infrastructure in our movement net right now that we are deeply investing in not just to be able to make an impact in this particular election, but that we're gonna keep investing in and have for next year. And it's it's sort of against the grain in some ways to reinvest in some of the day-to-day grassroots organizing, Um, but it's so critical. It's so critical if we're really serious about about building power. And um, I think it was, I think it was you, Cindy, who was talking about people being uncomfortable um, with with power. And that's why I just, I don't know, I just, everywhere I want to go, I just want to talk, uh, talk about us winning, not as like the pie in the sky dream, you know, one day. I mean, but there is no successful liberation struggle in this world where the people who led it didn't believe that liberation was possible. And so, because... And so when I think about power, 
I think about us having the power to do what Tanjiwe was just saying. So let's have a power building strategy so that we have the power to deliver to our own people in time. I'm not talking about in January, but you know, um, but maybe not as far as we, as we were once told <laughs> um, that we have the power to have health care for all our people and actually quality schools for all our people and an economy that works for all people and cares for all people. And so I just think the power building is really crucial. And, but the power building from the local level without shared national strategy is also gonna be, is we need to overcome that. We need to overcome our fragmentation so that we're not just a bunch of, you know, thousands of local power building um, efforts but we actually have shared strategies so that we add up to more than the sum of our parts um, when we're all headed in the, in the, in the direction of, of liberation and freedom. Comrade Cindy, we're, um, we're approaching, we're approaching the end here. And I want to, I want to, I mean, sometimes people are like, are you sure you want to do an hour long show? I'm like, we get to the end of the show and it's like, this should have been two hours, maybe longer. Um, but I want to make sure to bring you in and give you the last word. We, we had all kinds of questions lined up for you about, inside strategy and the Democratic Party and a whole bunch of other things, but you know, there's so much content on the table and you bring just so much depth. So I wanna give you the last word. All right, well, definitely um, this conversation needs to continue at our kitchen tables on the on the blocks with our mask on, you know, in our Zoom calls, in, 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 um, in all fashions, right? Um, I think one thing that's really important is that this is a moment that bring, that we need to be political weavers, right? Um, Cross pollinators. Um, we need to be inspiring people um, to lean in into what's hard, but also into what's possible. And I think that we got to fight um, the level of individualism, cynicism, um, negative shit talking, and be able to be like, what's at stake? And how are we going to come together to make those visions real, right? Because we've been busting our asses to work on, like, for example, a just transition to a anti-racist, feminist, uh, regenerative economy, right? We know that the Green New Deal, the Thrive Agenda is a tactic that takes us to that bigger vision, right? And we can't lose sight of what our bigger vision is. Folks, some of us believe in socialism for the 21st century, right? With all the lessons learned. Some of us believe that we, in, in, in reimagining radical democracy from the ground up, that really uh, puts people and the planet at the center, not capital and not profit. And so I just think that to me, that's what we're up uh, for, right? And that's what we have to keep clear of that's the horizon we want. Um, but we got to do the hard work of, gra of doing the grassroots organizing, the movement building, um, the coalition building, and being able to be clear about who our enemy is and the urgency of this political moment um, for our communities. Because we have to think about the children who are still in cages, the 206 a thousand people that have died only in the in the United States, much less the world. And we got to think about all the people, all the struggles from the land defenders, the people like the indigenous people defending their lands to um, folks, uh, women fighting the women that were uh, forced uh, sterilization in, in um, detention centers. Those are the people that we have to front and center um, at, and this fight about what we're up for. So one, uh, become an election um, defender, um, join the front lines. Um, I'm going to do a shout out to Seed the Vote. So everyone doing some level of GOTV work that is grounded in community um, is all relevant and important. And right I want to invite people right to the rising majority as having a tribunal against white supremacy and white terror. And we're going to have people like Arun Dato Roy, um, uh, uh, Let's see, uh, Angela Davis, uh, Alfred Woodox, Raquel Willis, um, Oscar Lopez Rivera, Tom Goldtooth, who are going to be judges. And so on October 17th, um, we're going to have a tribunal. And then the next day, we're going to have a Congress so that we're not only clear about what we're fighting for, um, it, because that, at the end of the day, is what has to take us through this moment. That's right. Thank you so much, everybody. We're come to the end of the hour. 
Um, it was a great show and it, it was so, it just feels so such an important moment that everyone for these next four weeks to possibly longer will be um, really working together and to contest mm -hmm. for power and to get rid of this guy um, who apparently is arriving back in the White House from the hospital um, as we speak. Oh, and uh, thank you so much for sharing us, sharing with us the, your strategy for up until that moment and after that moment. Um, thank you to organizing Upgrade and to Real News Network who put on this show, um, to all of our panelists. And let me kick it to you, Rishi, to close us off for the night. Oh, man. I love y'all. This was amazing. Thank you. Really inspiring discussion. Um, you know, we, I think this is just, this is, this is grinded out time, right? Like there's a lot on the line. There's work being demanded of us. Um, we have to demand, uh, you know, of ourselves that we push to build the world that we want. And, you know, we also have to push ourselves and our organizations and our comrades for more and better strategy for sharper thinking right? We have to, we have to have plan in place to build the kind of world that we want. And like uh, all of the panelists said in their own way, we have to be in deep relationship with each other. So That's again, right. just much love to all of our panelists. Please uh, give Organizing Upgrade a like on Facebook and YouTube. Um, thank you, Adam, for another great show. Um, we will be back with This Is Not a Drill about a week after the election with whatever is happening in that moment to sort of sum up what we've learned and where we're headed at that time. Um, but for tonight, that's it. Keep on struggling, keep on fighting, keep organizing, keep rising up, be powerful. Until the next episode, have a good night.